So on the heels of uh, my guest, who the uh, Dr. Terence Farrell, Chairman of the Economic uh, Development Advisory Board, in comes a uh, gentleman who we've had here before, and we're always happy to have him. He's a chartered surveyor, the managing director of valuation, uh, the valuation firm uh, Raymond and Pear Limited. He is a fellow of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Uh, he's also a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institute. Until recently, was a member of the Joint Consultative Committee. His name, of course, is Mr. Afra Raymond. Good morning to you, sir. Hello, good morning. Oh, there we go. There and we go. good morning, Rennie, and good morning, listeners. It's a pleasure to be back on this show. Um, uh, I have to say I find myself smiling as I'm following Dr. Terence Farrell. <laughs> One always has to wonder who opens the batting. So this morning the batting was opened well by Dr. Winfred James. And because of your age, I am going to use an analogy that you should be familiar with. You like cricket, yes? App- apparently. That said. is like going in with Desmond Haynes and Gordon Greenwich opening bat and you or Roy Fredericks or Rohan Kanhai coming That's in right. after. That's right. <laughs> you have a tough act to follow. You yeah. can't beat that with a cricket a bat. tough act to follow. <laughs> well, That's it's good right. to have That's you here right. this morning. We have a number of things mm-hmm. happening. And I, I, I think I want to open uh, the opening salvo, continuing the analogy of cricket. I'm yes. going to start with some pace. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to actually start with the question of Mr. Dupre. Oh. They, the, the, I'm talking about <laughs> Mr. Dupre. Is that Dupre. Sunday? Uh, um, yeah. are, you being, are you being like... <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got to start. I've yeah, got yeah. to start here. The public is wondering, a silly pun, but there why you are we hearing from and why should we pay any attention to what... The owner of Clico, and he still owns shares, I understand, to what he is saying. Why should we be paying attention to Mr. Dupre in this Clico CF, uh, CLF uh, situation? Well, you see, I, I certainly never believed that there should have been any bailout of that collapsed company. Mm. I know that other people will differ with me, responsible and respected people will differ with me, but I don't believe there should have been any bailout from public money to be spent to, to, to rescue these adventurers in the CL Financial Group. That should never have happened. Mm. The effect of rescuing them with our treasury money was that, in fact, the people who ran the company into the, into the terrible situation it found itself in were spared mm. lawsuits mm. and mm. possible violence from the people whose investments and whose income was wrecked. Okay, now we have to deal with all of this. And when you ask the question, why should we be dealing with Mr. Dupree? And people are asking this question and so on. And the reason why I raise it is because sure. he said he has made overtures mm-hmm. to the I'm government sure of Trinidad has. and Tobago yeah. and, to the, and to the Minister of Finance yes. that he is now in a position to put in the money through his new set of investors to repay all the money that has been expended um, to pull out uh, CLF. However, he does add later on, if you pay careful attention, I don't think it was all of that money. Yes, well, this is the point. The first thing we need to understand is that I'm not a lawyer, but from my understanding of the situation, Mr. Dupree has got the right to do what he's doing. Mm. As much as I may think it's wrong and I may think a man like that should never be in charge of a company like that ever again, the fact is that he has a right, and the reason he has a right is because he has shares. Mm. Now, if the bailout had followed the pattern of bailouts in other parts of the world, his shares would have been relinquished. What percentage of shares are we talking about? Well, in fact, in the case of AIG, which is which at the time was the world's largest insurer, American insurance group in Wall Street, when the AIG was rescued by the U.S. Treasury, they had to give up 85% of their shares. In the case of Citibank, when Citibank was rescued by Wall Street, by um, this, the federal authorities, they had to give up 79.9% of their shares. And in the case of Mr. Dupree, the reason Mr. Dupree is able to have this conversation with us and to put these proposals with all of his very excellent advisors, the reason Mr. Dupree is able to do this is because he has kept a, a, a controlling shareholding. Okay, which in fact is what is driving the discussion. That should mm. not have happened. And what's interesting for us to consider as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, what is interesting to consider is why was he allowed to keep the shareholding? Mm-hmm. Now, I was told, this is just the person who, who told me this. They know who they are. I'm not going to call their name. I was told back in 2010, in the first part of 2010, before the election of May of 2010 that the PNM lost, I was told by a cabinet minister, someone who's very versed in these matters, I was told by that individual, I asked the person, I said, why didn't, why didn't we just take Mr. Dupree's shares? Why didn't we get into this long shareholding agreement that's 20-something pages long on this one signed and that one witnessed? Why didn't we just make him sign a piece of paper that said, I need this money to avoid being sued, mm-hmm. and I therefore relinquish all my shares and, and leave the whole thing in the hands of the government. And the person 
why did we go into that long, long-winded arrangement? Mm-hmm. And the person chuckled very cynically with a social setting. And the person said to me, ah, that's a good question because <laughs> we had legal advice. And the legal advice was that if we went to the step of taking all the shares mm-hmm. and appointing all the members on the board of CL Financial, all of those people would have been subject to the Integrity Commission because, in fact, it would have been counted as a state-owned and a state-controlled enterprise, mm. just like HDC or Unicot or TN Tech or any one of those ones, okay? And if we did that, we wouldn't be able to get people to serve. That was the thinking. Let me see if I get this right. Let me finish. Right. Mm-hmm. Let me finish. Mm-hmm. And the person said to me, we had advice. Mm. We got advice, and the advice said, if you arrange something where you could put people on the board, but you let Dupree keep his shares, mm-hmm. you might be able to sail around the integrity requirements, which is something that I, something else I've been grappling with. Because as far as I'm concerned, CL Financial fits the definition of a company mm-hmm. under state control as established in the Integrity in Public Life Act. All of those people who are directors of CL Financial and all of those subsidiaries should be completing declarations under our Integrity Act. And in addition, CL Financial is also a public authority under the Freedom of Information Act, under the definition section. This is a very serious gray Mm -hmm. area that we need to really understand. Why is it that Mr. Dupree could be confronting us with these proposals now? And the reason why is because he still has the majority shareholding. The real question... Mm -hmm. Why does he still have the majority shareholding? We are when, in fact, he mm-hmm. approached the central bank and the Ministry of Finance in a state of extremists, it was literally a situation of the lender of last resort. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lender of last resort can make demands, which is what happened in the United States context in Wall Street, well, which think... is what happened in the city of London. It did not happen in both of Spain. And the question is, why did it not happen in both of Spain? We have to get serious with this thing. This is a question of our country's patrimony. But I think, you, no I, I, think, I, I think you answered that. In yeah. the case of AIG, yes. um, you were talking about uh, the discussion is what has uh, buoyed um, mm-hmm. Bernie Sanders to yes. where he is. The yes. discussion of too big to fail. Mm-hmm. In the case of Citibank, who had to get rid of 79% of their holding, too yeah. big to fail. And now what you're telling me in the case of Mr. Dupree mm-hmm. and CLF, it was too many to jail. Yeah, too big to go to jail, in fact. Well, too, this, many, too many too will many, go. I mean, many, that's yeah. what you said. So yeah. this, is really, mm-hmm. this is really the first big question, really, mm-hmm. about the proposal. Mm-hmm. We then we then could move to the other point, which is a question about the actual at the actual terms. So Mr. Man keeps his shares, mm-hmm. he obtains the right to borrow as much money as he needs to borrow to pay his debts, which is what it, which is what it was. And in fact, that borrowing, let us be very clear, listeners, that borrowing was on a zero interest basis. <laughs> no interest was paid for that borrowing. Somebody recently, I think it was Anthony Wilson in the Business Guardian a couple of weeks ago, yes. um, for, with, with whom I used to be friendly. Anthony Wilson had an article in which he, he mentioned the fact that the first $5 billion that went into CL Financial, I think he mentioned that $4.9 billion of that was on a 4.75% preference share. Mm. And uh, I, I have not seen the document that confirms that, but even, even if we are assuming that you are correct, Anthony, that's for the sake of discussion, let's assume that you're correct. That would mean... If we take your argument and it's full and we, 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 we agree all of the points in your argument, that would mean that of the $25 billion we've invested of all public money into this ca- catastrophe, <laughs> only $4.9 billion had interest running on it. And then furthermore, Tony, if we carry out an interest rate analysis of 4.75% in 2009, what we would realize is that 4.75% as a, as a preference share rate in 2009 was very, very advantageous. The current preference share rate done for the purchase of that ultra-low sulfur diesel project down in, down in um, Petrotrin, the $25 billion of the 35, 25 million of the 35 million that is being paid by that company to purchase the, the, the decommissioned plant is a 6% preference share. Right now, the interest rate in the country is about 6%. At the time, the interest rate, when Mr. Dupree got that preference share at 4.75%, the interest rate at the time was 8 or 9%. Mm. It was preferential. It was preferential. It was preferential. The question we need to insist on, an, on getting an answer to is why. It is still the case, as far as I am concerned, no interest is being paid. And the last thing we need to understand, Renny, in terms of the demands Dupree is making and the, and the situation the country finds itself in, because we are all in this situation, eh? 
I mean, I may make party political points from time to time about the PNM having done this and the UNC and the partnership having done that and, and Mr. Imbert, what he did and he didn't do and so on and so on. But the country is in this situation because what we have to realize is that <clears throat> if we are looking at a negotiation where Mr. Dupree has said that in fact he's not sure what the figures are and that he's been presented with certain estimated figures. He's, he's saying these figures he's are... He's saying figures don't make any sense no, to him. He doesn't make accept any sense, them. No. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two approaches to mm -hmm. that. And of course, the Minister mm -hmm. of Finance, Mr. Imbert, has responded by saying that, in fact, he himself is having a review of the figures. His figures are about $24 billion. He himself is reviewing the figures. Mm -hmm. And he himself will come up with a, with, a, with, a, with a response to Dupree in the next three or four weeks. I think it's Ernst and Young, an international accounting firm, is going through the figures and so on. Now, this raises two or three important points. The first important point is that this is not the first time that a sitting minister of finance or, or a sitting governor of the central bank has declared that we are on the verge of working this out. We have an arrangement. We have mm. an outline. We have a framework. And that is announced with great fanfare. And a few months later, you don't hear anymore. What happens? And we're going to get to that when we get to the third point. But the first point is that it's not the first time. Mm -hmm. but, the but, second mm -hmm. point Dealing with Mr. Imbert's statement about getting the figures and getting the figures out of, out of Ernst and Young and they're working on it and three or four weeks we'll have the correct figures and he'll have detailed figures to work with. The real question has to be, going, and we, I know we're going to the Auditor General later, Renny, the real question has to be, how could we spend $25 billion and don't know what we spent it on? What, <laughs> how, how could it be that the Minister of Finance, and I'm speaking about this as an office, not as an individual call, call member, but mm -hmm. how could it be that the Ministry of Finance or the Central Bank could have dispensed $25 billion of our money and, and be unable to touch a button and get an account of where it went?